Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, just finishing up for the day. I got a few things going on, and I thought, as usual, that on the spur of the moment, I'd share them with you. Um, just finishing uh, putting together a reconditioned gearbox, and I watched a guy the other day who did that uh, job uh, on a number of videos, and uh, very experienced technician. And it occurred to me how many different ways there are to skin a cat, to use an old saying. Um, and it just occurs to me, I mean, I, I get kind of picked on by people at different times. So not picked on is not the right word, but um, if I do things differently to somebody, that doesn't make it wrong. And neither does the guy who was shown on our page, on our Airheads page the other day. Um, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It means that the methodology that they are using, they've been taught in the course of learning their trade. My learning has come from mainly Michael Schneering who is a VW mechanic trained and had worked for um, Donnie Wilson in Sydney in the in the 80s um, for a long time. Michael is, a, is an extreme gentleman. He's one of my best friends. Um, he is a gentle, knowledgeable, competent man. And a lot of what he does is very, very much old school. He, he can fix absolutely anything with almost anything. I've seen him with a scroll saw under his arm making shims out of the sides of coke cans and all sorts of stuff when he can't get a shim thin enough. Um, he's a very competent um, man with his hands and, and very thorough in everything he does. So obviously I take a lot of notice of him uh, because he taught me. Other people, like like other people, like the guy in the, the movie on the technician the other day, he's been taught in his trade another way in a BMW shop and that is how he carries out his repairs and he or the company that he works for has to warrant what they do. I have to do the same, other people have to do the same. If, you, if you're not offered a warranty, there is an implied warranty in the consumer affairs situation which will force any manufacturer to offer or warrant their work if they sell it commercially. So I just give a 12 month warranty on my work. It's really simple. It means that I've got peace of mind and my customers have got peace of mind. So why am I saying this? Well, when you look at a BMW Airhead, there is so much crap written about it on forums and in, on internet posts and by people propagating a myth that does not exist. These are, it, it, the myths are myths. The, the, the things that are said don't exist or don't happen in the way that they say because people adopt the idea that the, the, the BMW motorbike is the only one of its kind in the world and the only thing made that way and if you if you change something by a hair well you're going to blow it up well that's not right however they are like the stripe on your credit card they are bulletproof they are strong they will cop a massive amount of abuse but you can break them with a single scratch and that is the point that I keep on trying to get through to people by making videos. I'm not trying to tell you how to build a gearbox. I'm not trying to tell you how to do your brakes. I'm trying to show you what's involved in them and what the design, as far as I'm concerned and how I was shown, is telling you. And if you look at the design and what the design is telling you and you think about it, it will also tell you how to fix it. I have a different way of shimming a gearbox. This plate I bought from the States years ago, it's 750 thousandths of an inch thick, I think in thousandths. So unlike the factory plate where the bearing sticks up through here and they measure the extension and the, and the depth of the plate, I use a depth micrometer. This is the depth micrometer, this thing here. Right? So I use that. It's digital. I can't, my eyes aren't good enough to read the finest, finest detail anymore, so I use one with a digital screen. All my stuff has digital screens except for my daily caliper which I can read an M8 or an M16 or whatever bolt with that. What you're doing, this is 750 thousandths of an inch thick. So if I measure down to there, from here, down into there, down into there, down into there. Now notice the baffle plate, that's important. I come up with a number of, of thousandths of an inch that that sits below a 750 thousandths of an inch thick plate. Here's the sheet. I made up a little spreadsheet that runs on my laptop. And you can see in the plate, it's 
176 thou down, 155 thou down, 180 thou down. Then you measure the back of the gearbox. This is machined flat when it's cast. Right, so these surfaces and these surfaces are the same. We run a straight edge across them to make sure they're not warped or twisted. If they are, it's very, very hard to machine them flat again, simply because the clearances through the ends of them are 20 to 30 thou. You might get them clear, but if you don't have enough room left, the back scrap. So we have to be a bit careful with that. Uh, when they're bored in here, they're machined down to a standard, down to a let here here and here that's the input the lay shaft and the output shaft and we use the same depth micrometer there to measure them and they come up and this is off a fairly late model GS so they always their tolerances got better and better and better as time went on so 176 to 180 thou 155 thou that's down less in the plate because of the baffle. And I always measure each gearbox with each individual baffle in place because they do vary. Sometimes they get warps in them and they need to be thrown away. The back's the same. 600 thou, virtually 600 thou this end. So if you look, they cross over almost. 626 is the depth of that hole in the middle and that there is to allow for the baffle plate on the other end of the shaft. So when the computer goes through and does this for me, it tells me that the total gap we've got is 26, 31 and 26 thou. Now the good book says that um, you shim to 4 thou. It doesn't say, the good book by the way is the BMW factory manual, it doesn't say shim to 4 thousandth of an inch plus or minus, it says 4 thou. Now I've read that many times and I've thought about it and I've had gearboxes that I've had by virtue of need to shim slightly differently. Always looser by the way, never, never tighter these days. Um, and that comes too with experience. But what I did find is that uh, this particular one here is actually 5 thou I've allowed in there. This is, is 4, 26 back is 22, 31 back is Four thou is twenty-seven, but I'm going to um, I'm going to call it um, twenty-six um, for the purpose of an exercise, and the, I won't go into the details, but it's to do with the baffle plate. Trust me on this one. So twenty-six thou is where I'm going to shim it. I'm going to allow an extra thou clearance in there, um, and this one here is twenty-six back to twenty-two. So that's my shim values. How do I get those? I've got a box of shims. Hundreds and hundreds of the little buggers. And they are expensive. I've had some made over the years, thinner ones particularly, um, so I can get closer to my goals. Um, and it's quite acceptable to use a couple of shims if you need to, sometimes three. I, I can't recall having used three. I prefer to try and find two that make up the value. But that's just me. And then once they're done, they are put over here. These are ready to go in in the morning. So there's my input shaft, my lay shaft and my output shaft shims are there. Um, conveniently ready to be put onto the top of these. We'll then heat the back up and, um, and tap it down. This particular one's got a kickstarter in it. That's the inside of the kickstarter mechanism. And this goes onto a gear on the input shaft. It's not really practical in the late model bikes, I have to say. I don't know if you can see it there, but I, on these, I always get a file out and just file a little 40 degree, 45 degree chamfer on there to make it easier to locate into the hole in the other end of the gearbox when you're trying to put the back on um, and it's hot and you're trying to get everything to line up and knock the shim, not knock the shims off the bearings, etc., that's a very handy little idea to have. And again, I'm not trying to tell you how to do this, but what I am saying is the big thing about these gearboxes is that they've got solid steel, huge steel gears and huge steel shafts in there in an alloy case, just like a VW. VW is who trained Michael Schneering. The crankshafts, they're, they're massive. This one here was in a movie the other day. We had a needle roller bearing go through it and marked up the front housing. 
Uh, I took it down to a specialist because when there's any kind of question of anything like that, I preferred it. I, I felt the crank was well and truly in spec. In fact, was in very good order, but I wanted it checked. And uh, he mic'd it up for me and I got him to polish it and he did a very good job of, of cleaning all that up. So it's ready to go. But look at the size of the thing. A modern Toyota Corolla wouldn't have throws like that in its crankshaft. They're very strong. But they're like your credit card, the stripe on your credit card. Tough, durable, almost bulletproof. Go anywhere, get wet, put it through the washing machine, still work. Put a tiny little nick in the wrong place and it won't. And these bikes are exactly like that. That's why I really try to tell people not to, not to do things with them until they're sure of what they're doing and how they should be done. And it's not touting for business. It's trying to save the bike. I use one of these. Head temperatures go up to 180 or more degrees Celsius. So heating a block or heating the back of a, of a um, crankcase to 110 or 120 degrees, not going to hurt anything. The engine hits that fairly readily. But you need it to get these bearings in. And the funny thing is, when they're running in the bike, the temperatures are right, they can move around. So that's what your shims are for. They're there to stop them. And trying to get the shims to the closest you can means that there's the least differential between the three shafts when they move around. So they move similar amounts. If they all move back, they all move back the same amount. So they mesh the same way. That's why I spend my time trying to put more um, time into polishing and making sure that things move slickly and why I spend a lot of time shimming them because to me that's the trick that the shift cassette um, and 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 the and the, the squareness and appropriateness of the various bits that we use it's gone on a bit longer than I thought but I just thought I'd share these ideas and reasons and thinks and thoughts and hope that when you think about doing something on your bike, inform yourself, arm yourself with knowledge. It's the cheapest and easiest thing to acquire and will give you the best result in the long run. Stay well till we meet again.